So let me let me get us started. On behalf of the UC Master Gardeners of Santa Clara <clears throat> County, I'd like to welcome you to Growing Lavender for your garden. My name is Sharon Erickson. I'm a Master Gardener volunteer here in Santa Clara County, and I'll be the moderator for tonight's session. The University of California Master Gardener program extends research-based information about home horticulture and pest management to the public. Tonight's program is being co-sponsored by the Palo Alto City Library. We are very grateful for their support. And now I'd like to introduce you to Joan Clodier. Joan's been a UC Master Gardener volunteer since 2009. Joan, if you could take it away. Okay. All right. I'm going to talk about <clears throat> growing lavender in your garden tonight. Okay. And <clears throat> first, lavender, it's a genus um, is the lavandula, and it's in the mint family. <clears throat> there are at least 40 species of lavender. Some people say somewhere between 37 and 47 species of lavender. <clears throat> the name lavender in Latin, it means it's called lavare, that's the Latin word, and it means to wash. Lavender contains a lot of essential oils. It's a very aromatic plant. Of course, being in the mint family, <clears throat> those are very aromatic plants in the mint family. Joan, Joan, so, this yeah. is Joan, this yes. is Sharon. Take a drink of water. <laughs> okay, I'm <clears throat> going to. I'm sure everybody would be happy to wait for you for just a minute. It's tough when you start speaking and can't get that <clears throat> thing out of your throat. I'm, I'm probably okay now. Okay. Okay, but anyway, some of the characteristics of the mint family are four stamens, opposite leaves, and a square stem. Probably the easiest to remember, a square stem. A lot of times when you see this, you think, oh, probably in the mint family. Okay, so lavender history is really fascinating. It was a really important plant in the whole history of our, since um, the ancient Gre Greeks and even Syrians. <clears throat> so a long history of lavender from Syrians, ancient Greece, Egypt, Rome, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, all the way up to today, this plant had so many desirable characteristics and it was spread to other areas of the world at a really rapid pace because it was considered a pretty valuable plant, it had a lot of good characteristics. Okay, a little bit about um, more about lavender history. It's uh, when you see English lavender, it's not native to England. <clears throat> Okay, it was brought probably by the Romans, maybe the Phoenicians to England. But anyway, it's really native to the Mediterranean. Also to the Canary Islands, there are some species native there. Um, the Azores Islands, you know, off the coast of <coughs> Portugal. <clears throat> Southwest Asia, Northern Africa, like Morocco to Egypt. And there are even maybe one or a couple of species that are native to India. So lavender was really important to early civilizations. It was cultivated for many centuries. Again, spread by Phoenicians, Romans, Syrians, you know, to other areas. And this guy on the bottom here, um, he, his name was, um, he was a Greek physician named Dioscorides, and he collected and studied medicinal plants in the year 77. And one of his favorite was lavender. He did a lot of, I guess, research on lavender and figured it was a good medicinal plant. Okay, another, a few other things about the ancient history, the Romans, they used it all, there were Roman baths all over Europe and they used it to scent baths, to scent their clothes. It probably smelled bad in those days too. Linens, disinfectant, they used it for disinfectant too. Some healing qualities, they might, might have been rubbing it on their skins if they had sores or something. They used it to repel insects and, and more. And the Egyptians used it to embalm people. And they actually had stills for oil in those days in Egypt where they were making perfumes. I guess Cleopatra, uh, she wore perfume. <laughs> and they um, also used lavender for healing qualities. <clears throat> okay, then the Middle Ages, when that came, lavender wasn't that popular during the Middle Egypt. Middle Ages, um, it was used to disinfect, um, no, I'm sorry, it was used to repel the plague, but I guess it didn't work too well because the plague was pretty bad, but it was used to scent rooms. 
And what's interesting, reading about the history of lavender, a lot of the monastery gardens had it. But remember, the monks, they were transcribing writings from previous era, you know, in books and things like that. Maybe they knew more about lavender than, than what we all thought it, or in those days anyway. So they, there were lavender gardens at almost all the monasteries. So that's pretty interesting. Then the Renaissance and later, um, again, it was used as a, lavender was used as a disinfectant to scent clothes and make perfume. And then Queen Elizabeth in the 1500s, she loved to use it in tea and she claimed it helped her migraines and she used perfume and she made lavender more popular in England or in that part of the world. So I think um, reading, they either, lavender was already there, but it wasn't very popular yet, but they might've imported more from the Mediterranean regions or used what was there, but they started putting it in lots of castle gardens and the affluent people who had gardens, they put lavender in there. And um, so that was pretty interesting. So maybe, well, they think maybe that's where it got the word English lavender because the lavender that they, that was so successful in England growing over the winter was Lavendula angustifolia, angustifolia, okay. And that, now they call it English lavender. So again, it didn't evolve in England, but the English loved it. And then when the Victorian era came, Queen Victoria really made it popular for everything. She scented everything with lavender. Okay, um, a little bit about France. Um, in the 1800s, lavender production, there was a huge increase of lavender production in France because they started making a lot more lavender oil. And there were a lot of fields planted all over the Provence region, kind of in the southern part of France and distilleries were set up to produce lavender oil. And there were a lot of successful perfumeries that were started near the town of Grasse, and that's in Southern France. And the perfume industry is still really big in that town of Grasse. Um, so it became very successful. And here you can see an, an old still, open fire still. And then on the right side, all the women would harvest the lavender then for the oil. They were making it for the oil. Okay, now the oil, it's pretty interesting, the oil. Um, lavender is really rich in essential oils. So here are some of them. And I don't know if this is really a complete list or not. I'm not a chemist, but these are a lot of important um, different oils that are in the lavender oil. So different species and hybrids contain various amounts of these different oils. Um, some of these essential oils are better for a, a pleasant scent for perfume. Others are best for scenting cleaning products. Um, some have antifungal and antibacterial activity. So lavender oil is really a complex mix of phytochemicals. So not only the amount of this oil in the different species of lavenders is important, but the ratio of the compounds to each other varies in different species of the plant, different hybrids and cultivars. So again, there's a lot of chemistry in lavender oil. So a lot of times it depends on the use, um, what they're gonna use the oil for is what species they might select to make the oil out of. Lavender by, oil by itself, I will say, can be poisonous in small quantities. Remember, it's super concentrated, so don't drink it. And there are some unproven claims about um, lavender and some of the products on the market have unproven claims. So you'll see stuff all over the web, but you probably don't wanna try making antibacterial or antifungal products by yourself unless you're an experienced chemist or something. Because again, there's a lot of chemistry to this. Okay. So what's lavender important for? Well, one of the things it's used for is culinary purposes, foods and drinks, um, everything from cheesecake to cakes and pastas. Of course, the herbs of Provence, that has lavender in it, and that's real popular. Everything, puddings, chicken. I made lavender chicken once and it turned out really good. You know, you put garlic with it and it tastes really good. Um, a lot of iced tea, regular tea, lots of different drinks even drinks with liquor in them. And you can find so many lavender recipes on the web. 
One thing I noticed looking at recipes, a lot of times they put lemon and lavender together. They must complement each other flavor-wise. Um, okay, so one of the things I wanna mention about lavender for culinary purposes, the species that's used the most for this, and it's the best one, this is the one to use, is Lavendula angustifolia. And that is the English lavender. That is the best one for culinary purposes. Um, some of the other lavender species have high camphor oil or high in different oils that are not so good for, um, for flavor. And a, a high amount of camphor oil, it's not good for you either. It's not good um, to eat things that are high in camphor oil, but you probably wouldn't want to anyway. Um, but I notice on the web, sometimes you'll see things that like Spanish lavender, oh, good for scenting things and good for culinary purposes. And some of these websites, they don't really know what they're talking about. You really probably shouldn't use Spanish lavender for flavoring food. But I mean, you're not going to kill yourself by having a few leaves or a couple of flower buds or anything. But still, it's you'll find the flavor is much better with the English lavender. Okay. Um, now, lavender. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to say this. The leaves of lavender, of the lavandula angustifolia, or English lavender, that's also very good flavor um, for food too. So you can use the flower buds or the leaves. And one time, a long time ago, when I was at some nursery meeting, they had lavender leaves on top of cheese, just a few little cut up lavender leaves. And it made the cheese, the flavors just really complemented each other. It's pretty good. Okay, now lavender oil is used for tons of products. So many household products have lavender oil in them especially cleaning products, other products, soap, lotion, perfumes, cosmetics, potpourri, pharmaceuticals, um, some of the lotions to help soothe, you know, cuts or sores or whatever. Again, the antibacterial um, properties of certain oils in the lavender oil and aromatherapy, relaxant. So all kinds of things that lavender oil is used for. Okay, the other thing lavender is used for is um, bee production, like honeybees. Um, honeybees um, love lavender. Okay, and um, let's see. One of the things is that um, honeybees can smell the lavender for over a mile away. And the nectar of lavender has a very strong scent. So lavender is a really desirable plant for beekeepers. But not only that, lavender is also used for, um, to attract pollinators to your garden. So it's a great garden plant. It attracts butterflies, hummingbirds, and different bees. And what's um, really interesting is lavender doesn't only attract honeybees. It's very good flower to attract bumblebees. It also attracts our native bumble, bumblebees. And there was a UC Davis pollination specialist who's found many of our native bees love lavender and almost prefer it. She made a comment Oh, in the, the bee garden at UC Davis, she said um, the, the bumblebees, there are almost more bumblebees going to the lavender, you know, than the honeybees. But anyway, there was also a study done at University of Sussex in Great Britain about lavender, honeybee, lavender, honeybees, and bumblebees. It's pretty interesting because they say bumblebees have long tongues. They can efficiently extract nectar from lavender flowers much faster than honeybees can. So they don't need to spend so much time on the lavender flowers as honeybees do on each flower. So that's just a tidbit of information that's kind of interesting there. And of course, um, most of us, or almost all of us here tonight, looking at this, we have a garden or we love gardening. So lavender is a, a really big plant used in drought tolerant landscaping. And just a wonderful plant to use. It grows so well here in California. Um, Okay, okay. Well, getting back, I just want to mention, so they say there's between 37 and 47 species of lavender, depending on, who, you know, who the expert is. Um, some people feel that you shouldn't, that maybe there are two, one species where others think there are two different species. But anyway, it's, it's pretty close. Okay. Lavenders contain, yeah, they all contain very um, many volatile oils. So again, there's a difference in the oils between the species. Okay, so they divide lavender into like three main groups and um, 
in the, the publication from UC um, University of California by Pam Geisel. Okay, she talks a little bit about this. Three groups of the genus Lavandula. There's the Spica group, the Lavendin group, and the Terastochas group. Okay, classification though, and she mentions this in her bulletin, it gets confusing. And there's still a lot of places that are using old classification and it it's, gets confusing. And there are so many species of different hybrids between them. But of the three main groups, the first, um, the first group, the Spica group, that includes like the Lavendula um, and Gustafolia, the English lavender. Okay, so um, that's important for gardening, for making dry flowers, potpourri, and the English lavender also, there's a, some specialty perfumes that they like. They like to make oil out of the Lavendula angustifolia. It's not the biggest species for oil, but there are some specialty oils they get out of it for perfume. Okay, so that's the English lavender or Lavendula angustifolia. Now there's another group, the Lavendin group. That's the second group I'm gonna just mention here, my cursor, Lavendin. Okay, um, that's really an important group commercially because this is the biggest um, group where lavender oil is made from. This group um, is, okay, the lavendins, they're really a hybrid between Lavendula and Gustafolia, the English lavender and the Portuguese lavender. And there are also some good garden plants, um, but the main reason for this is oil. You know, this is the biggest um, group that gives you lavender oil. Okay. And then the last group is the Spanish lavender, the Terra Storchas. All right. But again, the lavender, um, uh, the nomenclature sometimes does get confusing. And I noticed looking at the research when I was doing research on some of this stuff too. Yeah, it does get confusing. Okay, so there's, here's kind of a chart that shows some of the types of lavender and some of the cultivars that are real popular, like the English lavender, the Hidcote, Munstead, a lot in blue, and there are a lot of others that are, you know, very popular. The English lavender or Lavendula angustifolia. And then um, the French lavender, oh, sometimes they throw the French in with, this is again, the nomenclature confusing, and the Spanish lavender together. But the true French lavender is really Lavendula dentata. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The Spanish lavenders usually have this rabbit tail flower it's very distinctive and different than the English lavender. Okay, the Portuguese lavender, um, that's used um, to hide as a height. Well, that's used to cross with English lavender to get the lavender group and make oil. That's the main reason for the, or what the Portuguese lavender is used for. And then there's an Egyptian lavender that has fern-like leaves. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, but first, um, the Lavendula angustifolia is the English lavender, and that's used to flavor foods, um, special, again, some specialty oils for perfume, and there's many, many cultiv cultivars for gardening. The English lavender is a lot more cold hardy than most of the other lavenders. Around here, you, you'll rarely see any frost damage on the English lavender, and that's again why it grew so well in England. The English lavender has narrow leaves. You can see on this picture here, very narrow leaves. There are so many new cultivars all the time. And I used to be in the horticulture industry and I still get some of the publications like Greenhouse Grower and some of those. And it seems like every year there are so many new varieties of lavenders. The plant breeders love lavenders. Okay, here um, it shows, here there's a cultivar called Thumbelina. It's very compact, very small um, plant. So there's just, you know, lots and lots to choose from when it comes to English lavenders for your garden. Okay, then we have the Lavendula dentata. This is the true French lavender. And it's easy to identify because it has toothed fuzzy leaves. You can see this. And maybe as you're looking at these photos, you can think, oh yeah, I've seen that before. And it does look different than the, the English lavender. Toothed fuzzy leaves and it's Lavendula dentata. It's usually not used for culinary purposes because it has a lighter and a more piney scent. 
but it's the oil from this is sometimes used in cleaning products. This will not tolerate severe freezing temperatures. However, in the Bay Area, we're okay. Where I live, I get frost every winter. I get down to 25 degrees sometimes for a few hours, um, you know, on clear nights. And I do have a little frost damage on the top of my um, French lavenders and some of the other, not the non-English lavenders, but it never kills the plant. So if you're in the Bay Area, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Okay, here's some pictures of the Lavandula um, dentata or the French lavender. And um, the plant is really nice. It, it's kind of an upright plant and you can get different cultivars of this. Some are shorter and more compact than others, but it's a nice tidy looking plant. It doesn't flop over as much. It grows a little more upright. It's just a beautiful plant, just really nice and tidy. Um, let's see what else about this one. Okay, oh, it's good, good for containers too, of course. Okay, now this is the group that has high commercial value because it has high essential oil content. And this is the Lavandula intermedia and it's in the Lavandin group. And again, this is the sterile hybrid between the English lavender, the Angustifolia and the Portuguese lavender, the Latifolia. And there are no seeds in this. It usually gets larger than English lavender. It can get over three feet, sometimes four feet high. And it has a, a really, the flowers have a high essential oil content. So this is what um, they use. This is the main one that they use for oil, but they use others for oil, for different specialty oils too. But and this is the biggest one here. Now, this is also used for home gardens. There's a, um, a cultivar called Phenomenal. And I have two of these, I have, they have, it comes in white too. I have a white and a purple one in my front yard and it gets pretty big right now. It's probably about three feet tall, but the one, uh, so it's become a real popular garden variety. Um, okay, the, the Grasso and the Provence are two that are used um, to make oil, lavender oil. Now there may be some new cultivars they're using now because again, there's new research every year and sometimes they, start changing into new varieties too. But again, this group, it's sterile. You have to propagate it by cuttings or layering and it doesn't produce seeds. Okay. Um, okay, this one here is the Lavandula or the Portuguese lavender, I think. The Portuguese are spiked lavender. Um, okay, this has some, this is the Latifolia. This has some antibacterial and antifungal uh, qualities. It's not as common as a garden plant, but again, it's used for the essential oils. It has higher camphor oil than the, um, the English lavender, the lavender or lavandula and gustifolia. So the oil is used in some antibacterial lotions, but this um, produces, there are a lot of natural hybrids between the Portuguese and the English lavender. They just naturally hybridize in the wild too. Okay. Okay, Lavandula lanata. This is woolly lavender. This is a really cute plant. It's very soft textured. It just looks soft and it's fuzzy, but more woolly. It's um, just, it feels really good. It's used in potpourri a lot. It has a real pleasant balsam lavender fragrance, but it's not used for, maybe it just doesn't have high oil content or something. Um, it grows maybe two to three feet. Sometimes you'll see it in the garden centers. Um, it has a real woolly appearance and it's native to the dry calcareous soils in Spain, in Southern Spain. Now this one here, um, this is a hybrid between the Dentata and the Latifolia, it's a lardi, the Lavandula alardi. Okay, um, so this is a hybrid. I'm really impressed with the Mirlo variety. I have this in my yard and it's um, beautiful. It's a real bright foliage, um, bright foliage, a bright plant. Um, and it's become a very popular new cultivar. The Mirlo foliage is extremely fragrant. It doesn't produce a lot of flowers though. They're few and far between. So you don't grow this for the flowers. But I think my plant egg, I say it usually try to save my plant eggs. It says, it has some of the most fragrant foliage of any lavender. So the, um, it's really nice to cut um, 
make cuttings or put them in bud vases in your house. And I love pruning this lavender because when I prune um, the when I prune the ends and then I step on the, the prunings, it just smells so fragrant. So this is the one for fragrant foliage. It's called Mirlo, and it's kind of a new variety, new cultivar. Joan, this is Sharon. Is that one fairly compact? Well, mine is about two and a half feet tall right now, but okay. it's real full. It's bushy. It's really bushy. It doesn't look like the um, the English lavender at all. Um, of course, it's a hybrid between the French and the, the Portuguese lavender, but it's it's totally different. It looks, it has a different look. You can see like this picture, it's more, but this is from UC Davis, this picture on the left. It's really bushy looking. And that's how mine looks. It looks like more of a shrub. That's what it looks like. But the foliage is very variegated and kind of bright color foliage. Thanks. So, yeah, it's kind of cool. Okay, so anyway, um, let's see. The next group is the Spanish lavender group, the Lavendula stochus group. It's not for culinary use. It's high in camphor oil and has a piney fragrance. So you don't wanna use this for, for cooking or flavoring foods. It does like warm climates. It is susceptible to some frost damage, but I wouldn't worry here in the Bay Area too much. But um, some species seed real readily, and there are some that have become invasive in Australia and Spain. <laughs> but there are many cultiv cultivars available, and not all of them will produce seeds. So some popular cultivar cultivars are Anouk and Bandera Pink. And anyway, so Spanish lavender, there is hundreds of Spanish lavenders, just like French. Um, like the English lavenders, just hundreds of different cultivars of this variety here. Okay, and here are some more cultivars here. This is called Princess. This has become really popular in Australia because it doesn't seed and it's real bright pink. And again, the Spanish lavender has this like kind of rabbit tail flower-like, kind of looks like that. Okay, so that's the Spanish lavender group. Now, a little bit about, oh, one more thing, the fern leaf lavenders. Now they look totally different. Um, fo the foliage looks totally different than the other lavenders. It's fern leaf, like look at this foliage. It, it is all, it looks like, like ferns or something. So anyway, there's <clears throat> two in this, um, mm. there's these two lavenders, the lavender multifida. Okay, that's the Egyptian lavender and the lavender pinata. They're both very closely related. It's just that they say that the multifida, the Egyptian lavender evolved in the Northern Africa area and maybe also some of the Western Mediterranean. But the other one, the pinata evolved in the Azores and like maybe the Canary Islands. So they just, um, you know, their native land is a little bit different, but it's very, they're very similar. And the flowers look a little different than the other lavenders too. But I've seen this in nurseries, I've grown it. I don't know what happened to mine. I, I know I used to have some in the yard because I remember it looked really different than a typical lavender. But again, if you have a lavender garden, you could have all kinds of different species of and cultivars of lavender because there are so many and so many look different too. Okay, so lavender in the garden. Um, you know, they're just so, there are so many, but um, what you want, oh, anyway, lavenders are very drought tolerant. Okay, some of the reasons we might use them in the garden, they're drought tolerant, beneficial to pollinators, they're deer resistant, low maintenance, um, don't have to water much once they're established and maybe prune once or twice a year. And it's real easy to prune lavenders. They're very fragrant. And there are so many varieties and plant sizes available too with, la with um, lavender in your garden. Okay, planting lavender. Okay, what you want is full sun or almost full sun. You really need sun to grow lavender and you need really good drainage. If you're on clay, in clay soil, maybe try to make a slight mound so that the roots are never gonna be sitting in soggy soil. They like a slightly alkaline pH and most of our soil is slightly alkaline or very alkaline around here. So yeah, they can tolerate an alkaline 
pH real easy, better than acidic. They don't grow well in acidic soils. Very little fertilizer is needed when planting. If you're planting it in your yard, you can add some compost when you're planting lavender. <clears throat> and in California, the best time to plant lavender would be in spring or fall. The best time to avoid planting would be in the middle of summer. And probably winter isn't a good time either if it's raining a lot, but summer, um, that's when you get root diseases the most in summer. It, it, so anyway, yeah, try to avoid that. Um, Okay, planting lavender in containers. The soil should drain really well. Use a, an extremely um, good porous mix. Choose a sunny spot. And again, um, in containers, you will need some fertilizer, but use low rates or low amounts. Like example, if you're using a water soluble fertilizer and it says a half teaspoon to one tablespoon per gallon of water, use a half teaspoon, go at the lower end of the rate on the package. You can keep the container soil um, slightly moist. That's a good idea. Don't let it totally dry out, but never soggy. Okay, a few other things you don't wanna, um, yeah, you don't want them sitting in, a, in one of those saucers with a lot of water in them. Okay, you could use um, something like cactus mix or mix maybe half potting soil and half cactus mix because you really want good drainage. I really have to emphasize, good drainage for lavenders because the number one reason for lavender deaths is root diseases, soggy or wet soil that come from soggy or wet soil. And there's a really bad root rot disease called Phytophthora and it can spread really fast, especially if you water too much in summer. That's why it's best to plant lavenders in fall because you might end up watering them too much if you plant them in summer. Joan, can I yes. can I ask a couple of questions about that? So what about sandy soil? Okay, Alex is if asking. A, okay, if it has a coarse sand and the sand, you don't want just a little bit of sand in like a, in a potting soil. Um, it, sometimes it actually takes up some of the pore space, but if you have like half sand or over half, if it's a really coarse, um, and the coarse sand, and if you have like half, if half the amount is sand in your in the soil mix, like cactus mix, then it would be okay because that will drain better. But it's just like when you put peat moss, or if you put clay and sand together, you get almost like cement. If you put peat moss and sand together, and you don't have enough sand, um, it will take up some of the the little particles of sand take up some of the pore space. So if you use sand, use a lot of it lots of it and use a coarse sand. And, and what if your ground is just sandy? I know some parts of like the top of the Santa yeah. Cruz mountains can have real sandy soil. Well, oh, that's probably fine. <laughs> um, okay. okay. Lavender evolved actually in more like gravelly rocky soil, but uh, sand would probably be drained better than clay. Okay. You know, than clay soil. And the other thing, if you're planting in clay soil, if you want to mix a little bit of a porous substance, such as lava rocks or pumice or something, but not too much because you don't want that um, soil near the lavender so different than your native soil. But a little bit of some porous substances might be okay. And then, I, I'm sorry, but and before you leave containers, um, Hung was asking about lavender and pots. How big a container do you need? It depends which lavender you're growing. Look at the plant tag. Or look online if you have a variety in mind, a different a variety, because on the plant tags, I have some kind of in front of me, and it will, it usually tells you how big they get. So the container depends. Now, if you're gonna plant something like um, like the lavandula intermedia, the one that's in the lavendin group that gets three feet tall, you need a big container for that. You know, maybe like a 15 gallon or you know, because it's gonna to get to be a pretty big plant. But if you're growing one of those light, uh, small ones, like say that thin, Thumbelina, or I'm looking at a plant tag in front of me, this set says Lavella, La, La, La it's a Lavella compact dark violet lavender. It's funny, some of these plant tags, they don't even tell you the species. I think like we were saying, the nomenclature gets confusing sometimes, but here it says, gets um, six inches to 12 inches high, and you know, it might spread a little bit, but something like this doesn't have to be in a giant pot. You still okay. might want something 12 inches wide, you know, and maybe 
12 inches deep or something like that. But, and then just one more right now. When's the best time of year to train? If you're going to replace a lavender in a pot, would you do it now or would you wait until later in the fall? You know, um, I, I, if it were me, I would wait till the weather gets a little cooler because okay. again, um, Phytophthora root rot. Oh man, I remember um, I used to work in horticulture in the nurseries, the wholesale growers. Phytophthora was one of their biggest problems in summer, growing like one gallon containers in summer. You know, they're always struggling and they of course use fungicides, which most of us don't. <laughs> so they're always struggling with root diseases in summer when it gets really hot and the containers get warm. So I, I think I'd still maybe wait till fall. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. Now, watering lavender. Um, okay, so if you're planting a lavender in your yard, you wanna keep it moist until well-established, but never soggy. Again, if you can take soil near that lavender and squish it, and if it stays in a ball in your hand, if you can make a ball and it and the clay just stays in a ball, it's probably too too wet. It should be moist, but more crumbly soil. It shouldn't be soggy. Or if you can squeeze it out like a sponge, you have way too much water. Okay, so wait, you know, until well, water. Just keep it more. Keep the plant moist until well established. Now, lavender is pretty drought tolerant. Um, once it's established, maybe after one to two years. You can let the plant dry out between waterings, but make sure it's well established first. Once established, you might not need to water more than once or twice a month or less. I have lavenders in my yard that I don't even water in summer, and I kind of forget about them. I don't have irrigation in all parts of my yard. I live on an acre, so I kind of forget about them, and I have one there that's like 15 years old, and it, I never water it in summer. It's fine. <laughs> So anyway, but just, you know, use your judgment on that. Maybe once, maybe twice a month, but maybe less. Okay. Okay, watering in containers. Again, you wanna keep soil slightly moist even when the plant is established and make sure the container has lots of holes on the bottom and don't use a saucer under the pot because sometimes that pot is sitting in water then. So, you only use a saucer if you're going to dump it out after you water the plant. Okay, a few things about pruning lavender. Lavender is classified as a sub shrub, which means the, the new growth does not get woody after one season. The new growth is succulent or tender. So when you prune it, you don't want to prune into the woody base or you might lose the plant. So they recommend pruning about a third or less of the leaf tips, which are succulent, which are, you know, they don't get woody. And a good time to prune would be after flowering. Okay, here's an illustration on the left again, prune after flowering. And here it shows pruning the leaf tip about a third off. And they say sometimes if you're gonna plant a new plant, you can prune, prune off a little bit off the top. Um, I've planted lavender without doing this and I know a lot of people have and done okay. But anyway, um, you can do this if you want. You know, the roots will get more established, especially if the lavender is blooming when you buy it. Um, so you might get a light re-bloom re after that. Okay, um, pests. There are very few pests that really, um, that really go after lavender that are gonna kill the plant, especially. Sometimes you get spittle bugs in spring. It looks like spit. And they usually go away in a week to one or two weeks, or maybe three weeks at the most. Um, in summer, you might get spider mites if it's hot. You might get thrips, leaf hoppers. The right, I'll admit this plant is really a rosemary. That's also in the mint family. But um, thrip damage looks the same on lavender. But you know, usually it's not gonna kill the plant. What will kill the plant the most is root rot. Phytophthora, root rot. That's what kills lavenders more than anything else. If you can't stand this, um, maybe meet neem oil, but never use it when it's too hot. But anyway, you know, I don't think you're going to have to use anything on lavender. It, again, pests are not the biggest problem. Okay, lavender um, propagation. 
Okay, some of them produce seeds. Some hybrids and cultivars do not produce seeds. Okay, you can um, buy some seed packets, especially of the um, <clears throat> English lavender, lavandula, and gustifolia. Um, but one thing about lavender seed, it can be a really slow process. Okay, it can take you know more than a month to germinate, and you really need about seventy-five or eighty degrees to for seeds to germinate well. So it's kind of a long process and difficult. Otherwise, you could take soft wood or hardwood cuttings, or you could layer a branch to produce roots, like on the right-hand side. So anyway, what about cuttings? Okay, um, semi-hardwood cuttings, a good time to do this would be in fall. Okay, you can um, take some cuttings off the plant, make sure your pruners are sterilized when you take the cutting. Um, then you wanna trim the cutting, the middle picture, see this cutting, you wanna trim off the top and take off a bunch of bottom leaves. See what they're doing here? They're removing most of the lower leaves and trimming off the top. You cut off the top here. And then you dip it in a rooting hormone for best results. Then you wanna stick them into fast draining soil or coarse, coarse sand. You can use 100% coarse sand, cactus mix, perlite vermiculite mix or soil mix with lots of perlite or fast draining mix again. Okay, but sticking them in a rooting hormone first would really be a good idea. They'll root better that way. All right, now softwood cuttings, they're best taken in early or mid spring when the plant is actively growing. And this picture came right out of the, um, the bulletin that posted the publication from um, UC Extension agent Pam Geisel. And here it shows you, you trim off a branch here and you take the heel with it. See that little like heel? They're taking off this branch and this is all kind of new growth here. He's taken off this branch, but leaving that heel with it. You don't have to, you can do just a tip cutting too, but um, a lot of people think this works a little better. Take this off, trim off the top to, and only leave a few leaves. And then you put this in um, a rooting compound and then in your soil mix, that's fast draining. Misting helps too, but I know a lot of us home gardeners can't do that all day long. <laughs> okay, then the easiest way to propagate is layering. And you know, if you have an old lavender plant that's getting woody and, oh, by the way, maybe I didn't mention this, the average lifespan of lavenders is about 10 years. Some will last maybe 17 years if you have really good conditions, but 10 years is usually about, about average. But if you have an older lavender plant, you could take some lower branches. Um, this isn't a lavender here, but it's a good illustration and bend them down, bend them way down near the soil and then um, either stick them in the soil or cover the lowest branches with soil and then take the leaves off of the covered, strip off the lavender leaves of the covered area and then put a staple or something to hold it, the branch in place. And this is good to do in fall and over the winter, you actually might um, like in early spring start getting some roots. Okay, when roots appear, they can be cut off from the mother plant. And if they're near that mother plant, maybe you want still want a lavender in that spot anyway. And this is how lavender spread too. This happens naturally a lot in our yards. A lot of times you'll see um, lavender or even sage or some of your other plants may be spreading. And you look down and maybe a bunch of leaves over the winter covered some of the lower branches and then it rained and it was nice and moist and you got new roots producing. So this can happen naturally. But this is the easiest way to propagate a lot of our plants, layering. So when um, this could take four to eight months, it, I hate to say a timeline here because it depends on your conditions and it depends on the time of the year. But a good time to do this would be now start putting a branch kind of into the soil or soil over the top and kind of staple it down. And let's see, it's the end of August, winter is coming and you might have some roots appearing maybe next April or May. All right, okay, harvesting lavender. Okay, for dried flowers and culinary uses, the best time to harvest is when most of the flowers are still in the bud stage and only the few top flowers would be starting to bloom. So this might be a little bit over the hill, the flower on the right here. 
the flower on the left is just, or this is a spike with buds mainly, if those first two or three are just starting to bloom, that would be a good time to harvest because that's when the aroma is more pleasant, like for uh, flavoring food. And also if you cut them and put them in a vase, they're, they're gonna bloom anyway. So that's the best time to harvest. And when they do this for even potpourri and that, they harvest, they don't harvest when it's too old. Too young is better than too old. <laughs> Hate to say that, but <laughs> okay. So anyway, I think, um, I think I covered what I planned to, I hope. But I hope you enjoy lavender like the previous generations before us did. Because again, there was a lot of history and it is an important uh, plant. And it's, it's really a fun plant to grow and to see all the different varieties and, you know, from fern leaf lavenders to narrow leaf and French lavenders and different uses for the different lavenders. And it's just a, a fascinating plant that has a lot of history to it. So anyway, I guess I'll take questions if you have, if I can answer them. Yeah, so you've answered a lot of them already, but um... We've got a few people who are dealing with lavenders with woody centers. So Kim asked, how do you manage dead areas in the center? Matra asked, you know, she has a, he, she has a lavender in the ground. One plant is four feet tall, but it's got new leaves on the ends of it. So these woody plants, what's your advice on pruning, caring for them, replacing them if need be? Well, I mean, if it's really woody, if, if you're getting big dense spots in the middle, um, but if you want to try layering, that would be my first suggestion. If you really like that variety, um, try layering and it's really easy. And now would be a good time to start now or in fall before the winter, because you'll have moisture all winter. Well, we hope we do anyway, have moisture all winter long over that branch. So I would lay some lower branches down and um, try layering, try layering. See if you get some roots on some of those. So I, I think I, um, let's go back again. And I, I should make a comment too. Okay, this branch, they don't show the whole branch here, but it could be very woody over there. So you might want to layer, take, take some of those branches and try to lay them down. Even if if they get injured a little bit, that's okay. Some people even scratch a little bit where they're bending it. Um, but anyway, right here, what they did, they put soil over the main branch, but see where these shoots were? You may get four different plants here. After it roots, after these start rooting, you can cut off the stem or the branch to the mother plant, right? But you may be able to cut off one, two, three, four different plants because these, are all um, little shoots from nodes. And the node is what will produce some roots here. So you might have one, two, three, four different plants coming, um, rooting here. So I would try layering if you really like that plant. And, again, and um, lavender, you know, about 10 years, maybe 15, if you're real lucky, 17, but that's probably about it for the main plant. And then you talked about pruning. Is that also so pruning down a third, you know, of the growth so that you always have the green leaves? But is that gonna is that the method to help help it from becoming too woody? Well, it will get somewhat woody, but it will help. Yes, it will help. Um, Hung had a question about. Okay, I'm going to try and say this, Lavandula angustifolia. So mm -hmm. some of the varieties of those, I think you did show this, but they're Hidcote, Munstead. Oh, um, he, was asking, he was asking <laughs> about Grosso and Provence, and those are both those intermediate kinds. Yes, right? yes. Okay. And they will get bigger. They'll get a lot bigger. So yes. the common English lavender names that we see in the nurseries all the time include like King Coat and Mud Munstead? Yes. And probably others? Oh, lots of others. Okay, okay. It, like but look for that, when look that for I, that species name. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, yeah, it, they, um, Thumbelina is a good one too, but you know what, there are so many and there's so many new dwarf lavenders too available right now. So it, it's an unending supply, a never ending supply of lavenders right now. There are just so many. 
Rashmi is asking if all varieties are safe for dogs. Um, I never heard of, I, I don't know, I'm not an expert at that, but I've never heard of dogs getting sick from lavender. Yeah, okay. And then um, I can't remember if you already answered this, but Susan was asking how lavender oil is extracted. Is it the leaves or the flowers? The, okay, mainly they use the flowers. Okay. But you can eat the leaves, you know, you can, or you can flavor food with leaves. You don't eat a lot of them. <laughs> it would be too, too much, but. Um, okay. So the oil is mainly in the, they, um, commercially, they extract the flowers for the oil. And then Christina is asking for established lavenders that you're only watering once or twice a month, if that much, is it, should you be doing a deep watering? She, um, her yeah. her plant is, is over 11 years old. So uh -huh. maybe. Yeah. Might... Um, yeah, you, you wanna get the soil moist. Yeah, uh, you can do a deep watering, but I wouldn't water so much where I wouldn't leave the hose laying there for a long period of time where it's going to, where the soil is going to get soggy, especially in summer. You know, it's summertime, it's hot weather, hot weather and soggy soil, just like native, like a lot of our native plants. That's when you get Phytophthora. That's when you get root rot disease going through and it spreads really fast when it's summer and you have soggy soil. So, I, you know, just kind of be careful, you know, don't water too much, but yeah, it's kind of contrary to opinion, but maybe watering more in the spring. Yeah. If we if we don't get a lot of winter rain. If, if we don't get a lot of rain, yeah. But look where lavender is native to. It's gravelly, rocky soils, calcareous soils, and you know, the Mediterranean region, Spain. And some of those soils are, you know, they <laughs> they don't hold a lot of moisture. And that's again why. Lavender is so drought tolerant. You can kill lavender, it's, you'll more likely kill lavender overwatering it than underwatering it once established. You know, Matra is asking, um, so layering means that the branches are still attached to the mother plant, correct? Yes, until they root, yes. Then you can cut them off, cut it off. Right. And if your branches are really woody, you're going to have to find a branch that you can bend all the way down while it's still yes. connected to the mother plant. Right. Yes. Uh -huh. Janet is asking, how do you dry lavender? You know what? I, um, I, I saw a lot of pictures on drying lavender, but I am not, I'm not an expert. I'm more... <laughs> I'm more talking about growing lavender. There's lots of information though online about drying lavender. You know what I do? I get the granddaughters to uh, cut the lavender, tie it up, tie up a, a bundle of it with uh -huh. twine and hang it upside down. That's the pictures I've seen all over the um, online. I've seen that same technique used. Yeah, I've seen bunches of lavenders just upside down in drying sheds, yeah. Let's see, Alex is asking how to help a potted Spanish lavender that has sad drooping flowers. The flowers look a little dark. Does it need to be pruned? The flowers look a little dark? Dark. dark. Oh. So, it, yeah. yeah. I, you might prune it. I would prune it. If you're not satisfied with the flowers and they're drooping, maybe, the, that it, maybe you haven't pruned the plant before or something, but I would prune it. Well, it's a good time to prune it. If the flowers aren't looking great anyway, it's like, why yeah. not? Even why though not? a Spanish lavender, you're not going to probably try them. Right. right. Okay, right. Joyce has lots of lavender plants that were planted more than 17 years ago. Whoa. Whoa. They're looking dry. Do you recommend layering to try to spread them around? Oh, you, I would. Yeah, if you like them, I would. If there's over 17 years, you never know how long they're going to last. So. I would start layering if you like them, sure. And Marion is asking, she says she hasn't pruned her lavender in years. Can I do it now or wait for autumn? You could do it now. Yeah. I mean, I'll, most of us who are harvesting lavender have already cut it or are cutting it now. So it's a good time. Yeah. 
they're they're going into deep dormancy at this point because they won't perk up until it rains. Hopefully it'll rain. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Kathleen says she loves to bundle it up and hang it up, bundle up lavender stalks and hang them up. A brown bag keeps the dust off. Oh, I don't last long enough to catch that much dust, but yeah. Excellent. I think that's the questions that we've got. And we're like right on time. This is amazing. <laughs> so oh, Joan, I, I want to, it's, it's time to wrap up. And I want to thank you, Joan, for your presentation. You know so much about lavender. And it's so fun to hear and talk about. I want to thank the Palo Alto Library for co-sponsoring the event. And thank you to all of you for attending and for your questions and engagement during this Zoom session. For additional information, please check the Santa Clara County Master Gardener website at mgsantaclara.ucanr.edu. I'll be posting the video of this session on our UC Master Gardeners at Santa Clara County YouTube channel. And if you have any specific questions about something growing in your garden, please feel free to contact our help desk or participate in our monthly online plant clinic. You can find information on our website. And with that, thank you, good night, take care and happy gardening. Okay, bye-bye.